Hello there, I'm Matt Peters. I teach uh, publishing and distribution in the creative writing BFA. Guess I've got some of my students here tonight. Um, let's see, here at Full Sail University, that's where I do that, according to the sheet. I'm hosting this <laughs> session. They gave me this script literally 10 minutes before this started. I didn't even know there was a script. Uh, I'm hosting this session titled, You Think You're Ready to Self-Publish? Think again. Um, and uh, so let's put our hands together and help me welcome our panelists. I've got Kim Craft and <laughs> Tom Lucas. Wait, why am I applauding? <laughs> and Nicole something. Oquendo. I blanked. Oquendo. What? Oquendo. 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 <laughs> I knew I was going to blank on that. You won the applause meter. I know. There we go. Nicole, Good. congratulations. Good. That's what I like to see, guys. I'm going to introduce them more in depth in a little bit according to my script. Uh, <laughs> does the director need anything else, or are we good to go? I think I'm good to go in the it darkness. It like a thumbs up. It's just hard. Okay, to thumbs up. So, um, yes, I teach her full sale. I teach publishing and distribution. Uh, as does Kim. She teaches it in the business masters, so she's the next level up from me. And then uh, I also run a small publishing company called Beating Windward Press that does primarily fiction and nonfiction. And then I'm also a writer on top of that, which means with those two things, I have very little time to do my own writing. <laughs> um, kind of to introduce the niche of publishing we're gonna talk about today, there's kind of three avenues when you publish a book. There's what's called traditional publishing, uh, there's self-publishing, and then there's another subset called vanity publishing. Traditional publishing is where you send your work to a publisher, they evaluate it and decide if they wanna publish it or not. If they choose to publish it, which is very rare, most 99 times they reject it, but that one time where they say, you know, they'll accept it, and that's just my own rule, that's what happens. Um, they, you don't pay anything after that. They pay to design it and produce it, they pay to distribute it, they pay to market it, and you do your song and dance when they tell you to do the song and dance, and then they send you royalties. That's what's known as traditional publishing. The two keys to that being you have to submit and be chosen, the other key to that being that you never pay anything. Uh, Self-publishing is where you decide to be your own publisher, you're gonna handle the production and design, you're gonna handle the distribution, you're gonna handle the marketing, uh, and you pay for whatever you need to pay for, and you do everything yourself. You are essentially functioning as your own publisher. And then vanity pressing is where, or vanity publishing, is when there's an established publisher, but when you submit your work to them, no matter what it is, they say, lovely, we want to publish this. Pay us this amount of money for design and production, and then pay us again for distribution, and then if you want some marketing, we've got all these lovely marketing packages that you can buy. Um, the main caveat with them is they're more interested in selling you the services than they actually are selling your book. And most writers end up spending a lot of money with a vanity publisher and never kind of earn their money back in sales. Um, but what we're gonna be talking about is self-publishing today, which is where you decide to be your own publishing company. And I wanted to distinguish that between vanity pressing because it's a bit of a difference and you can keep your, keep your costs very low. So within the self-publishing world, we're gonna talk about design and production of your book, distribution and monetization of your book, that's a big fancy word for getting paid, and then actually marketing your book. How do you let people know about it so you can get paid? Uh, now I'm gonna introduce the other moderators as soon as I have a drink. Let's see. Take your time. Sorry, even though I can't see you, you're making me nervous. Uh, Kim Craft traditionally published several books, including Copyright and Publishing by McGraw-Hill, The Copyright Revolution is About to Begin from Hastings School of Law, Case Studies, Problems, and Projects in the Music Business, and Technology Trends and Developments in the Music Business, A Brief History, both published by Radix Press? Radicus. Radicus Press, big words. I have an English degree, I'm not good at reading them. Uh, but fascinated by the legal history of the Countess Bathory case, she spent a decade researching the history of the Countess Bathory, including more than a year devoted to solely translating the original source material from Hungarian. Um, dissatisfied with the marketing efforts and author support from her traditional publishers, she turned to self-publishing to do uh, her three nonfiction books on the Countess Bathory. And it is Infamous Lady, the story of the Countess Ezerbeta Bator, 
I butchered that, I'm sorry. Elizabeth Bathory. Uh, and then Elizabeth Bath Bathory, a memoir as told by her court master, and then the private letters of the Countess. Uh, these books bring together a corrected history as well as new and exciting source material for the first time to the English language audience. And writing her Bathory books is one of the few times in which her love for law, history, European languages, and a good horror story, if you don't know anything about the Countess Bathory, uh, all came together in one place. That's Kim. Hi. Your Hungarian is very good. My Hungarian is great, thank yes. you. How do you. How do you really pronounce it? Well, Hungarian's an unusual language. They, they, first of all, from English, they take the last name and put it first. So if your name is John Smith, they would say Smith John. Uh, so it's technically Bator Ershabet. Which sounds a lot scarier. Than I know, isn't Elizabeth it scary? Bathory. World's worst female serial killer. Worst. That's her claim to fame, yeah. Uh, I debunk a lot of it, though, unfortunately. So. You take all the fun I know, out of serial I do. killing. <clears throat> oh, and she's also a vampire. Yeah. Depending on I took some. The bunk, I took all that out, too. I kind of disproved that. Oh, and bathed in blood of her victims. I also debunked that. I, I, I know, I'm a was, joy. Was anything true? But she was a countess, much no. right? She was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tom Lucas did everything the other way. Tom Lucas self-published his first novel, Leather to the Corinthians, uh, through his own press, Room 1331, and then signed a contract with the preeminent bizarro publisher, Eraserhead Press, to publish his second novel, Pax Titanus. Uh, when not writing, he likes to drive fast and take chances. <laughs> all, all, all of that is true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nicole Oquendo is the managing editor of the Florida Review, I butcher it again? No, you, spoke, okay. you said Florida, right? A Florida, good. <laughs> Florida Review. The nonfiction editor at the Best of the Net anthology and assistant, assistant editor at Sundress Publications, a nonprofit independent press. Nicole is, author, also, yeah, yeah. Nicole is also the author of the poetry chapbooks Some Prophets from Finishing Line Press, Self is Wolf from Dancing Girl Press, and the hybrid memoir... Telomeres. From? <laughs> Zoetic Press. Zoetic right, so Press. So many presses, guys. i got to keep it in my head. <laughs> She's all over the place. She's Maybe. just, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not loyal. OK. <laughs> so now I want to get into the production, and I'll actually let them speak for a while. Uh, a lot of times, self-publishing kind of has a bad rep because a lot of times it suffers from sloppy editing or really thin or undeveloped research or plotting. And that's because a lot of self-publishers kind of rush to finish to publish their books. They finish their first draft and they say, I've got a book, I need to upload this and make millions of dollars. Uh, whereas most traditionally published authors don't do that. No traditionally published author publishes their first draft. Stephen King, as productive as he is and as good or bad as he is, depending on how you feel about him, he doesn't even send anything. The, the earliest draft he sends to his publishers is his fourth draft. So, Professional writers or, or traditionally published writers have worked on their books a lot. It's not a you finish a draft and you hit upload without ever reading it. So what I want to ask you all is that uh, what is kind of your feedback from readers and your revision process? Do you use beta readers? And how many drafts do you go through typically before you feel that you're ready to publish? And I'll just be very OCD about it and start with Kim and work my way down. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Matt. You know, you, you, you students in the audience will find this kind of funny. I was thinking about the draft and the revision process, and who better to help me with than my evil teacher friends? And I told them, get your red pens out and be as mean to me as you want. Now, what I recommend to my students is you want to get together a dream team of people who are very good at these kinds of things. Uh, like Matt was saying, I think a goal of self-publishing when you put your, your book out is that people will see it and they'll immediately think, oh, it's a real book. You know, in other words, it looks like it's traditionally published. You have great artwork on the cover. Your inside material is very well written, very organized. And probably every one of you has a dream team of people that you can go to for advice on these kinds of things. There are obviously pros out there who will pay you, who, I'm sorry, who you will pay them a lot of money to be book doctors or book editors. Uh, maybe not so much money, but you know, it, it, it's, 
it's a very involved process that uh, you, you folks can speak on at, at length. <laughs> um, but in any case, my dream team of evil teacher friends, I gave each of them a copy of the manuscript, said take out your red pens and be as mean as you can. Oh, they were delighted. They're like, yes. You know, <laughs> the, the tricky part is if, you know, I know when we create, for many of us, it's, it's a very deeply personal thing that we do. And you, you, you have to take off your hat as the creator and almost the parent of this work to give your child over to now it becomes commercial. It becomes a product. And when your dream team tells you, oh my God, Kim, why are you saying this? Or where's your authority? Or why doesn't this go here? And oh my God, look at these typos. I have to take my ego and say, sit over there, shut up, and listen to what they say and do it, because I trust them. And folks, I'll tell you, it's so funny, because my, my book went through five different revisions, and by the fifth one, every one of my reviewers said, this is good, and I, I read it, and I'm like, this is good too. And then it's really funny, because then I looked at my first draft, and I thought, how did I ever think this was good, right? So do trust your dream team. <laughs> it really is very, very helpful. Thomas. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, seeing as how Kim really handled that question quite well, um, I think the main thing is is that, uh, like with, with Leather to the Corinthians, um, I probably spent about six or seven years working on it. Uh, went through several drafts on my own, and then I started bringing people in to read the manuscript and to give me uh, honest feedback. Uh, for me, I started as a writer working at a newspaper. And, you know, uh, I basically was writing film reviews, but I had a very good editor. And the thing that I learned uh, very early on, like in week one, is that my writing was going to be as good as the person editing it. That uh, no matter how much I thought of my writing, no matter how confident I was, um, on my own, when I would sit down with a, uh, a quality editor and they would show me what, uh, what was wrong with my writing and they would edit the story down, they would always make my writing way better. And so I learned pretty much within the first couple of weeks to trust my editors to f not, you know, editors and writers are different breeds. There are writers that are editors and there are editors that are writers, but um, you, it isn't always the same, you know, an equitable sort of situation. So um, you should definitely not sit on a manuscript without having beta readers, without ha workshopping it, without having evil teachers or fellow writers. Uh, but most importantly, beyond all the feedback that you'll get from your colleagues, you need to have a good editor in place. You know, someone who's um, highly credible, you know, uh, highly qualified, uh, probably charges a lot uh, mm -hmm. because you will get what you pay for. Well, I, um, actually, I usually tell my students, you've got the network of other writers. You know who the grammar Nazi is in your workshop. You know who is not going to cut you any slack. Don't pay 10 grand to some editor. Use and abuse your classmates because then they'll just use and abuse you back. <laughs> And you can get or use your teacher friends. Mm -hmm. You don't always have to pay a professional editor, especially if you've got the network of other writers. Sometimes it's just a fresh set of eyes. Well, but if you, you want to yeah. pay Tom $10,000, <laughs> he will edit your book for you. I, I didn't pay an editor $10,000. So, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I think it was box tops, actually, was what I used. And a promise. <laughs> so there's a there's a really sweet promise in a shoebox somewhere, but um, no. What what Matt is saying is legitimate. You know, we this, there's a lot of creative people in the room, and there are a lot of people that you can use immediately as a resource. Uh, my path with my self-published novel took years and a lot of different eyes, and it went through a lot of versions before uh, it was finally published. The very final step for me. Was, was paying an editor specifically to proofread, to do layout. Uh, content had already been worked out at that point. She was not a content editor. She was really uh, there to line edit and to uh, nip the typos, because the typos are there. They're always mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Nicole. Hey. <laughs> so uh, I charge a lot of money. <laughs> and um, and it's great. I get to buy comic books with it. Um, 
So here's, here's the hard truth. I think we've talked about it a little bit, but I want to kind of hammer this home. Um, you guys right now have free editors. They are sitting next to you and around you. And these are the, this is the cohort that you are taking classes with. And uh, for me, going through graduate school, one of the things that I wish somebody had told me when I was in school is that uh, the people around you are going to be the editors that you will continue to rely on when you leave. That place. So be nice to them. Yes. So all those opportunities you guys have to workshop each other, all those opportunities you have to dig into the work with the response posts uh, that you're writing on each other's work, this is all fantastic opportunities that you have to develop and build that kind of editorial eye because that doesn't just come from nowhere. I mean, it comes from hard work, and the more you actually examine and you know work with the text that other people have to let you read, the better you're going to be at you know picking out those kinds of things on your own in your own text. Now, that being said, I think that uh, for Telomeres, uh, that book took me probably six years to write, and every single chapter in that book went through six or seven revisions, and then when the text was done, it went through global revisions mm -hmm. for about another year and a half. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> books take a long time to write, uh, but more importantly, they take a lot of time to edit. And if you don't have that support system around you, um, to help you through it every step of the way, uh, it's going to cost some money, which is you know one of the things that we might be returning back to. I think um, as we deal with these questions, um, you know, because the underlying thing here is that uh, self-publishing does cost. Um, you know, because unless you have all the skills in the world, and you know, don't beat yourself up if you don't, um, you are most likely going to be paying other people to help you out along the way, right? Um, I did not have to pay for an editor because I have editor friends, which was fantastic. Um, but I relied, uh, and still do rely, frankly, on uh, the people I graduated from college with. You know, they're my main readers, and you know, the people that know what I'm trying to accomplish when I work on a piece. Um, I recently, uh, that, that Self is Wolf chapbook uh, started as a single essay that I tried to write about a difficult subject. And mm -hmm. one of my peers kind of looked at it and said, you know, expand here, expand here. She made like 18 notes in a red pen. And a month later, it was a book mm -hmm. because of what she had to share with me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your readers are going to be able to do that. They're going to be able to find stuff that you, you know, maybe never even dreamed you were writing about. And you've been doing it the whole time. So mm -hmm. something to think about. Cool. And the beautiful part is, then you don't give them any credit. <laughs> <laughs> they give you great help. They elevate your book, and you give them a thanks in the back of the acknowledgments with nobody else is going to read unless they think they might be in your acknowledgment. So it's not like their name goes on it. You, you get to steal their advice and make your book better, make yourself <laughs> look better, and leave them in the dust. And they will do it to you. It's serious. It, this is the way it works. I gave a friend of mine a third of his novel, and I got a, a line in his acknowledgments, a third of his content, and I get... Thanks to Matt Peters, a strong reader. And I was like, thank you. You know, I only gave you a third of your plot, you know. Um, not that I wanted any more credit, because he totally did the same thing for my novel. All right, this is the quick answer round. Uh, you do have some options. You can print your book. You can do print only. You can do ebook only. Or you can do both formats. Mm -hmm. I put the books I do out in both formats, mainly because I don't want to leave money on the table. Mm -hmm. Kim? I do the same. Tom? Both, yeah. Both. Both. Absolutely. All right. There's a lot out there like, oh, you only need ebooks and print is dead. And <laughs> no, even yeah. if it's not the majority, you don't want to leave money on the table. All right. Um, Audiobooks, <laughs> too. Yeah. Why, no? Why not? Audiobooks, Audio books? yeah. If you can do them or you've got a nice, sexy voice like Tom does, then <laughs> the, totally that would be do that, that, That's correct. Yeah. 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 <laughs> do the audiobooks. Uh, which you can produce, you can record mostly with you know a simple laptop at this point, as long as you're willing to take the time and effort to mm -hmm. do it yourself. Most of this stuff you can do very mm -hmm. uh, economically if you do it yourself and take the time. So, actually, Tom alluded to hiring somebody else to do his layout. Um, I happen, my wife is a graphic designer, so she does a lot of my graphic design work for me and my layout and production work for me. Um, Kim, who does your production work for you and produces your different files? Mm -hmm. I, I went with uh, Amazon's Create Space, which is a print on demand, and I will confess I have no skills with design. Um, what I liked about them is they gave you an option if you do know how to use Adobe InDesign, for example, they give you all the layout specs and you can submit your own artwork. If you don't, 
don't like me, uh, they provided uh, 24 different templates to use. Um, you just pick the template you like for your cover matter. And there was something like 1,400 royalty-free black and white and color photos in different categories you could use. Or so long as you signed off swearing, I have the, you know, the intellectual property rights to these photos, you could also drag and drop your own in there. So I, I found that to be magnificent for my needs. It took me about, I don't know, 20 minutes to put the cover together. And it was then completely formatted according to the specs they needed. So it was effortless. How long for the interior? They also provide uh, the interior cover as well. Um, it, I will say that Amazon, their cover that they provide is a little bit clunkier than, let's say, iBook Author from, um, from Apple. I've used both. I find iBook's Author is really easy. You literally just drag and drop your text into uh, the inner matter template and it will format around you. You can drag and drop videos into it with, uh, you know, if you've got a Mac, it's, it's really easy to use that. Uh, Amazon and Kindles was a, a little bit more tedious, I'd say, but, but not impossible. It's still very easy and very doable to just cut and paste your material and, and set it into the template. Yeah, the first ebook I did took me about four to six hours, but then the second one, because I learned the process, took me two hours, and now I can mm -hmm. do one in about an hour and a half, mm -hmm. an hour, hour and a half. Uh, Tom? What's your hourly rate? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't really tell people how quickly I can do them because sometimes I okay. get stuff that's a mess. But I usually well, you, charge about a hundred bucks for an ebook. Me too. You've, you've shown your card, so now I know. <laughs> um, I, you know, so a paradigm that you can use, uh, especially at a school like Full Sail, is if if you're a band and you're going to record, then you're going to either rent studio space or borrow the gear to record your music. If you're making a short film, you're going to get the gear, either beg, borrow, steal, or rent. You're going to gather people, you know, to, um, you know, help you. And the same thing uh, with putting out a book. You know, uh, I hired cover artists because I had some friends that were phenomenal artists uh, back up in Detroit, uh, brothers. Actually, one has designed uh, one cover and one designed the other cover. So I actually got to work with both of them. And uh, with the self-published book, I, I, the woman who I hired to edit also did the layout. So it was kind of a, a package deal. Could I have figured out how to do it? Absolutely. Um, it was kind of a time crunch for me. And I thought, hey, you know, here's someone who's going to be able to do it quickly and professionally. And her, her rates were very reasonable. But, you know, you've got all the people around you. And uh, it's very easy to get something like this off the ground if you just, you know, if you look outside yourself and, you, mm -hmm. you know, you just ask for help. What did she charge for layout? Well, I'm bad. Just, just to give an idea. I don't know, $150 maybe? Yeah. And, and the illustrations, like I, got, I get my cover illustrations by a professional comic artist for about $200. Cover was, uh, was three. Three, but that, that was a painting. Like yeah, it was painting. His covers are, are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole? So I, uh, I sell art privately also, and so my, my cover <laughs> situation, the back of her car. Uh, just here's a shout out to myself, right? Um, <laughs> but no, my, well, that actually plays into this because my cover situation was a little bit different because I got to design my own, and not all publishers will let you do that. Um, but you know, I sent them some, it is a, I don't know, a combined thing that you kind of have to work out because just because you have a good idea doesn't mean it's gonna help sell that book well. Mm. Um, so I got the privilege, privilege, uh, of being able to use my own artwork for the last two uh, pieces that have come out, and I'm really excited about that. Um, not everybody gets to do that, otherwise you kind of have to pay. Um, I know that um, I also get tapped to do cover art uh, for other people, I got to, and you know, just because you get tapped for cover art, by the way, does not mean that you get to sell that cover art. A lot of the time, you will, you know, spend lots of time on a painting that the author does not like, which has happened to me frequently. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that's happening. That's really exciting. The very first time that that is happening, and uh, I guess what I'm, where I'm going with this is, that, um, yes, it does cost money. Um, but I think that a lot of people are more talented than they may realize, and it does not take a long time to uh, hang around on the internet, look at the covers of books that you love and figure out what ties them together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a little bit of research on your end can probably save you a lot of money if you see, okay, this book is selling this many copies, this mm -hmm. book is similar to the book that I am writing, this is what their cover looks like, what am I gonna do? And, you know, you could pay somebody to do that, 
or you can do that research on your own. Mm -hmm. It is a possibility to do that on your own successfully. Um, but again, the research is key, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And something that's gotten touched on a little bit, which leads into my next question is, or my next topic, whatever, is that just because it's called self-publishing does not mean you have to do everything on your own. Yes. Mm -hmm. Self-publishing mm -hmm. just means that you are not going to another publisher to publish your book. It doesn't mean you mm -hmm. can't hire and assemble your team mm -hmm. and work on it. And actually the term is team publishing or bringing in a team. And the books that make more of the, uh, more of the money in the self-publishing world are the ones that have taken the team approach to it. Um, I am pretty much a small press, but I try to run it as if I'm the only person doing it because I don't have any money to pay anybody. Um, but I typically, I use you know my wife for graphic design and cover layout. I've used illustrators, I've used photographers, I've hired proofers on big projects, things that I you know, think are gonna be, uh, have real breakout potential. Um, I go to specialists when I need them because I realize I can't do everything. Sometimes I'm paying them in, in beer and pizza. Uh, sometimes I'm actually, mm -hmm. as a writer, I have a very valuable skill. And you all, as writers, if you're writers, have very valuable skills. You can actually trade your writing services for professional services. I trade about a, traded about $150 worth of website editing to a photographer for a uh, $1,500 photo shoot for a cover on one of the books. Even trade. He needed his website copy edited and overhauled. I needed a picture. We just got together one night. There was some pizza and beer involved, and we shot a great cover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I traded him. I, mean, I, I definitely won on that deal, but he was happy. <laughs> so yeah. um, Kim mostly goes all the way through Amazon, and I guess we talked about what some of the rest of you do. Anybody want to add anything to the team approach? Well, that collaboration is just so important, exactly what you just mentioned, and you know, being able to tap the people around you, too. But I mean, you wouldn't, how do I say this? Like, you wouldn't know what the next phase in self-publishing would be if you weren't doing that research on your own anyway. And it's really important, I think, to, um, and I think you'll probably get there in the questions, too. But mm -hmm. it's really important to understand what the different phases of it are so you know what to ask for and what to look for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I skipped that part. <laughs> but, but the next question is kind of, to give people an idea uh, on the rushing to publication, how long does it take you all to produce your books from that final draft, okay, I'm not touching the text again, until you've got the product, either the printed book or the ebook is up and loaded for sale. So just the production phase, um, how long does that usually run you when you're putting the whole thing together? Say, now say that again. When the, from it, from the it, fun, it's not the writing. Completely written, it's, it's completely all, it's written. Ready. You've nailed down the text, okay. and you're going into the production phase of laying it out, doing the cover, oh, okay. converting it to ebook, and then it's ready for gotcha. sale. Okay. How long does that process usually take you? For me, with Amazon's Create Space, I, I will say I've gotten faster. I've put out now three books through them, so you know my learning curve does sort of go up a little bit. But I would say, on average, um, the time it takes me to set up the the, the the cover template is probably 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, the inner material I, that that will take me about two hours, maybe. If I, my books are a little longer, though they're nonfiction, they're about 400 pages usually, so it's a little tedious. But and then what's really nice, I upload that into CreateSpace. They usually take about 24 hours to review it. They're not judging the the quality of the book, which, which may explain why <laughs> some of these nonfiction or these uh, you know self-published nonfiction books out there aren't that great. But they're not editing it. They're not judging quality. They're really only looking to see that technically the spe specifications line up so that it will print out hard copies properly or it will upload to Kindle properly. As I say, that process takes them usually 24 hours, sometimes 48 if they're a little busy. And then after that, they'll they'll tell me it looks good on our end. Are there any last minute changes you want to make? That that usually I tell them no at that point. Um, and then from there, eh, depending again on their backload, anywhere from 20. 24 hours to maybe 72 hours for it to go live on Amazon. So the whole process is, is typically less than a week. I hate you. 
I'm sorry. That's why I use them. Yeah, they're <laughs> and they're free too. That's the other thing that just well, disgusts me. Well, I did me. pay a thirty-five dollar professional fee oh. once. <laughs> once that got me. That got me my the ISBN number, which we may talk about. It's it's the you know code that you need to sell in retail and the barcode also. Which if you buy those independently, in some cases you might be paying maybe two hundred dollars for both of them. So for my thirty-five bucks, yay, it was awesome. However, I must say that my my book on evil Countess Bathory have sold very well. There, there's, there's a lot of goth and horror fans out there that I, I love them. They love her and it's awesome. And because the books have sold very well, I have never had to pay that renewal fee. Usually it's every year you're then paying to renew and they were happy with my sales. So now they just give it, they really give me anything I want for free, which is sort of awesome. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was I was really tempted to call this three punks and a goth panel, you know. But, you, know. you know. All right, um, my just to, to contrast that, I'm usually working with an author and sending things back and forth, and it, my production process from final text to having the book uploaded and ready to go is is around two months. So one week to two months. That's that's why I, I'm disgusted with Kim right now. <laughs> Thomas, <laughs> it, it took about three months because I, you know, I commissioned the cover art, mm -hmm. and so uh, artists are wonderful people who are oftentimes a little unpredictable <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, timelines and production schedules. So, uh, you know, he did some mock-up sketches, which uh, what, that was initially just exciting to see some aspects of my story visualized, which was cool. Uh, he gave me about six uh, choices. Uh, we picked a direction, and then it took you know several weeks to get it to the point where it was. Uh, he was sending me a Photoshop file. From the, that point on, the actual uh, getting it up uh, on Amazon and all that stuff probably about a week and a half. I bought my ISBN numbers. I actually have about eight, six or seven, maybe eight left. So if anybody needs. An ISBN number. Oh, I, you bought the 10-pack. Yeah, I did. Oh, I bought fancy. the 10-pack. Yeah, so, because I have plans, Kim. Long-term goals. I have long-term plans. It's a career, not a sprint. So, yeah, right. so, um, uh, you know, so the, you, you do that, and you uh, copyright the material with uh, the Library of Congress. You get your Library of Congress number. All that stuff comes in, and it depends on how efficient people are, I'd say mm -hmm. that. But the whole thing from the point where the manuscript was done was about, I'd say, three months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Nicole? Yeah, um, I have two answers, one for um, a traditionally published text and one for a non-traditionally published text. So uh, how am I, oh, hmm, my brain is like this. So <laughs> um, I think that um, for the book that I had published in a traditional route, um, it took, because I, I don't know if we're taking into account the submission process in that question, too, right? No. No? Okay. Just just production. Okay. So if they were okay. to do their own so books, they have an world, idea. So in a perfect world, somebody will pick your book up that day, but in a not perfect world, that's not going to happen. But anyway, um, so the book was done. It was picked up. I opted to wait uh, for about nine months from you know when it was sent in, because I am a publication hype machine, <laughs> and uh, branding is incredibly important. And I needed a lot of time to be able to do things like schedule readings. So I last year was traveling around the United States hosting workshops and you know, doing readings and doing things, meeting writers that otherwise would have had no idea, meeting readers who would have otherwise had no idea who I was, uh, because these are the people that are going to buy that book from you. Uh, because otherwise, if you do not do this kind of footwork, um, you know, you can hit upload <laughs> in whatever it is that you're using, but you know, how are people gonna know who you are? How are people gonna find you? So I'm in, I'm in for the long hustle. <laughs> and uh, I, I had a, uh, one of the publishers that was working with me, they wanted to, I mean, from uh, acquisition to publication, they wanted to run that thing in 30 days. And I said, absolutely not. Uh, mm. <laughs> because uh, I, I didn't think it was enough time, especially marketing multiple books at the same time. That's a lot of hats to you know, have to wear. Mm -hmm. And you know, so it was really important to me to do it right. So I, uh, I opted to do things like pre-sell, um, which I thought was really, really important. I had a three-month pre-sale period before um, 
any of that stuff happened, and yeah, I, I go around and I do stuff, like speak at panels and mm -hmm. <laughs> you know attend conferences and, and things of that nature, albeit a really big one uh, speaking in April, which is very important. And you know that, that kind of stuff, I think, to me, is uh, you can't separate it from publishing, that kind of and that, that self marketing, is the way that self promotion. The traditional publishing route does, once the book is ready, they typically spend three months doing pre-publication, uh, getting reviews, building up, um, building up hype, building awareness, selling to the industry. There is a lot of pre, and a lot of self-publishers kind of skip that step just to go right into making it available. Um, not all of them have a recognizable name you know, or subject matter that, that sells itself. Um, Tom, at least, was relying on leather in his title. Yes. Um, puns. Puns. Puns, puns help play. Tom. It's very important yeah. um, strategy. But yeah, that is one of the traditional things that slows down, that is one of the things that slows down traditional publishing and a lot of self-publishers mm -hmm. complain about why do I need to wait mm -hmm. nine months or a year for my book to be out. Um, but that does bring us into kind of distribution. And we're not, sorry, we're not getting into a lot of the nitty gritty of yes, you need, this is where you go to get your ISBN number. This is where you go to get your, uh, where you go to copyright. This is, you know, the spacing and font choices you should be picking because a lot of that's very nitty gritty and you can pick that up on, in books on how to do it yourself. I really want to focus on. Can I just say it really quick? Go for it. You can get your ISBN at rrbowker.com. It's yes. r period, r period, b o w k e r.com. That's Website. where you can get, yeah. And you can do your copyright registration at copyright.gov, g o v, not .com. .com will try to get you to pay for them to fill out your form for you. You can register online. 35 bucks, um, you can pay right online to do it, copyright.gov. Yes. So th those two things are simple. <laughs> um, <laughs> Those are quick, but just sort of what's involved in the self process, the self publishing process, and everything that you have to do and take into account. And one of the big things is if once you create your book, you need to sell it, and to sell it, you need to get it to the customers or get it to the readers, the people that want to buy it, and that involves distribution. Mm -hmm. um, it's very clear. Kim uses Amazon. Do you pay the extra money for Amazon to go beyond Amazon's distribution, or do you sell exclusively through Amazon? It's Amazon and beyond. You know the $35 professional fee that I, I originally signed up with. What that entitled me to was not only all of Amazon's distribution and affiliates. That that's you know Amazon U.S., Amazon Canada, U.K., Germany, France. They have now India. It, it's it's really all over the world. But Amazon is also uh, a distributor in and of itself, and it has wholesale arrangements with uh, Baker and Taylor and Ingram, which are the two really big uh, entertainment media wholesalers. What that means when I self-publish through them, a assuming the book hits some pretty decent numbers. They don't tell you exactly what that is, but my feeling was once you hit about 200 in sales, that's when I noticed my book started appearing uh, in the online catalog for Barnes & Noble. Um, when it first came out in 2009, we still had borders in those days. It hit on borders. Then I noticed when it, it went over 1,000, it was populating in everywhere. It was hitting a Libris and Powell and Books a Million and, and, and pretty much everywhere. So they, they I, I tell my students about uh, wholesale and retail distribution. Um, when you go through a print on demand such as Create Space owned by Amazon like I did, um, the key is they can get you in those channels. It's not a guarantee they will. The book has to prove itself in sales before they kind of back you. So they'll get you, in my case, on Amazon, no problem. But if you want to get th through all their affiliate distributors, you do have to hit certain numerical benchmarks, which, as I say, they don't really tell you. I just kind of notice these trends myself. But when you do, you can get everywhere through them. It's, it's very nice. Tom? Oh, OK. Um, I was just so enthralled with Kim's answer, you know. Uh, so I use Amazon, uh, obviously, and uh, Leather was, was put up onto Amazon through CreateSpace. And for the first year that I had the book out there, it was in the KDP program. KDP means you are exclusive to Amazon and to Kindle and allows you to do things like offer the book for free as a download for certain weekends, uh, a part of the Kindle Unlimited program where people can borrow the book and that sort of thing. And I sort of played around with it, you know, to see if it would raise the book's profile. And it, it had some effect, uh, but eventually uh, I decided to pull it out of the program. And then I also uh, 
uploaded the book through Smashwords. Smashwords pretty much covers every distribution channel that you're not going to get through Amazon and Kindle. For and, e-books. Hmm? For, for e-books, e yes, for <laughs> e-books. And uh, what, what Kim had said about the, the print book sort of appearing in other channels, you know, um, not, not out of any sort of egotistical uh, motivation, but I routinely Google my book to see where it's showing up, yeah. what catalogs and things like that. And uh, first of all, there's some really great bit torrents out there that <laughs> <laughs> you can get my book off of, but um, those are things that you know happen when you have content out there. It's the internet mm -hmm. and that's just yeah. how it goes. Um, but I did start seeing it populate everywhere from Powell's to Ex Libris mm -hmm. to uh, German used booksellers mm -hmm. to everything in between. And it is very cool when it starts to sort of take it's, uh, you know, a life of its own. It, it's a pretty neat thing. So um, the, you got uh, lightning sources, your other option, right? And then that, basically, yeah. uh, but I can't speak to that. I'll, I'll speak to that. Nicole, are you familiar with the distribution for Sundress Press? A little bit. You guys kind of covered stuff. <laughs> oh, they only covered Amazon. I mean, I just, I don't know. We're I'm, leaving money on tables all over the place. I, I want to kind of play devil's advocate a little bit because you guys are talking about big sales. And I, in my personal experience, one of the first times I ever went out with a text that was mine, I sold 15 copies in three months. So, I mean, you know, it, 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 you got to be prepared for that, too. And, mm. you know, work out strategies for how to get yourself out there into the markets that you guys are talking about. Because if you're not prepared or, you know, you, you go into the thing with a vague understanding of, you know, what's expected of you or, you know, I just, a lot of people, um, how do I say this? Like they have really great ideas, but they think that just because, you know, that idea is a good idea for a book that that book will sell based on idea alone. And sometimes the conceit will sell a book, you know, like Abraham Lincoln, vampire hunter. Right. Um, but not every book is that sometimes, you know, it's just, you know, a fiction story you really believe in, and a novel that you spent six years on, you know, and, and you care about these things, but title alone is not going to sell it. And so, you know, a lot of, man, <clears throat> it's tough because, yeah, I, I chose to, like I said, go that independent route. And so it's been a lot of growing pains for me specifically over the last few years learning, you know, what works, what doesn't work, how do I get my book in the hands of other human beings that are going to care about it, um, you know, without paying for that kind of distribution and, you know, paying for that kind of marketing uh, because what you'll find too is that a lot of independent presses will not do that stuff for you anymore uh, which is another big thing so if you're considering an indie press you're considering self-publishing regardless of the route that you're going to go you kind of have to be your biggest champion in terms of getting that content into the hands of your readers so mm -hmm. you know like when you know Tom was saying you know I don't want to be arrogant or whatever what you, whatever however you phrase it um, you know googling myself well that's one responsibility that I think you guys have to do which is you know where am I where is this book you know who is reading this book what are the demographics of you know the people that are paying attention to this text how can I market to the people that aren't currently getting this text um, because you hear self-publishing and you know again a, a lot of the people that I you know consult with a lot of people you know even students uh, that talk to me about self-publishing um, their conception of what self-publishing is is that you know you put it out in the world and you're done but that's not mm -hmm. the that's case day one yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly and so there's day 5,000, <laughs> you know, where you're still out yes. there, like I said, doing that long hustle, you know, trying to get people to care about what it is that you're trying to do. And it's tough if you're not diligent and, you yeah. know, taking advantage of the resources that are and are not, frankly, uh, mm -hmm. available to you right away. Yeah, it's hard. Well, You're hiring yourself for a job, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to put uh, content out there, um, yeah, just pressing submit is the beginning, mm -hmm. is day one of your job, and uh, it's going to be your job as long as you care Mm -hmm. about it yeah. and then the day you don't care about it you will slide under the ocean of story and content that exists out there because there's so exactly. much choice mm -hmm. that you have no choice but to uh be in promotion mode mm -hmm. you know uh as much as you can be while still you know creating new Right. new works right your book is in a it has a product life cycle just like anything else and you, you always have to stay on top of it if it you know it's peaking and then all of a sudden it starts to dip and then there's that question what do i what do i do now to to boost it up again write another book yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the yeah. answer just, yeah that's right get caught in a scandal yeah it's really the time of the 
artist or author as entrepreneur, but you notice this, you know, even with traditional book deals where you think, oh, they're going to do everything for me. No, there's a clause right in the contract that says the author will do anything that the publisher deems necessary for the sale of the book, which pretty much means I wind up being my own promoter anyway, which that was one of the factors that led me to self-publish because I kept going to McGraw-Hill, and, and I don't mean to disparage this company, but the way the model works is they'll put their huge marketing machine and art direction and editing machine behind the top 10 bestsellers, you know, the top 10% of best-selling books, but the other 90% in their catalog, which mine was, of course, um, their position was, well, you know, we only do that for the bestsellers. And, and I would say constantly, you know, are, are you guys going to put out an ebook version? Oh, well, we only do this for the best sellers. Are, are you going to do an author website? Well, we only do it for the best sellers. And, you know, and then, but then they would say, well, you can do it though, Kim, so long as we approve exactly everything you submit to us. And that was really, for me, the defining moment when they were getting 85% of the royalties. I was only getting 15. But when the burden was suddenly on me very clearly to make those numbers and hit those, you know, those sales so I would get anything at the end of the day, I thought, this is crazy, which, which really did lead me to go to self-publishing. Uh, in that situation, uh, with an e-book, in my case, I'll get 70% royalties and keep my copyright. Uh, do I have to self-publish? Do I have to promote and self-promote the self-published book? Yes, I do, absolutely. But it, it's worth it when you're getting a lot more money. <laughs> yeah. that, it, it, that's a motivator for sure and there's also it's exciting to be in control mm -hmm. of your destiny mm -hmm. uh, when you're traditionally published uh, they're going to do with the book a, as they please that you may not get to decide what's on the cover you may not get to decide how the book is marketed um, what's you know the blurb that's on the back uh, any number of things. So when when you, when you are self-publishing or other terms that I also hear are indie publishing or author published mm -hmm. works, a number of other you know kind of um, names for it. Artisanal publishing. Ar yes, artisanal uh, publishing. The, having that control, you know, you you joked that it was three punks and a goth. You know, uh, I came up you know as a little punk rock kid. I'm a big fan of DIY. I'm a big fan of do-it-yourself. Uh, all the bands that I ever cared about when I was young put out their own records, packed the van, and drove around the country like Nicole did with her book. And I'm going to have to get the list of the bookstores you went to because I think I'm going to have to do that. Oh, I was so, outside of the right, bookstore. Outside, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah. I already have the hat for the change. So uh, there's that. That's right. But, you know, uh, there's something about being in control of all that stuff that's cool. My current publisher gave me all the control I had with self-publishing, uh, but they were also giving me the, um, the support system of a, a sort of a guaranteed readership, sort of a scene to mm -hmm. plug, to introduce me to, which was really pretty exceptional and exciting. But it is, it has a lot of the aspects of the self-publishing uh, lifestyle that, uh, it was a very easy transition. But this time around, you've got a sales quota to beat. I do. I have, I his have book. the pressure of a sales quota. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do. Whereas with my book, if it didn't sell, it's just a sad trombone kind of day. And, you know, <laughs> I have a chicken pot pie out of the microwave and, uh, you know, write a hate poem. But, <laughs> you know, uh, now I have sales quotas and I have to think about, you know, uh, outreach but I was doing that with the the self-published book anyway you know because the only way people were going to know about it is if I told them about it or got into a position where a lot of people could hear me talking about it you know so all right I'm going to sum up a couple of things about distribution real quick and then we'll get into marketing which it sounds like we're falling into anyway um, I submit all of our books or I publish distribute all of my press's books through Ingram uh, and their print-on-demand service lightning source which Ingram gets it in the books in print, and mine basically goes worldwide kind of right away without waiting for a certain sales level, but that can cost me, um, if I don't use my you know, discounts that I've got, it's $75 each book to enter it into that system, and then it's $12 a year to keep it in that worldwide distribution system. Um, but I can do it. The key thing is that you need to have something, a lot of people say, oh, I'm gonna have a website and I'm gonna set up my website and sell them off my website. Well, how many of you go to author websites when you go to buy books? Almost never, sometimes the publishers, 
Um, Kim, do you actually sell books on your website or you just refer people over to back to Amazon? I refer them to Amazon and there's a, a partnership affiliation you can get. It's free. They give you the HTML code you can just put right into your website and if someone goes to your site and then, for example, wants to buy the book, but I don't want to deal with customer service. I don't want to have to place the order and mail it and worry about people don't get it and then they complain they don't want it. What I do is they just click the button. It takes them directly to Amazon. If they then, you know, it'll take them right to the link on Amazon to buy the book. If they buy it from Amazon, then not only do I get my regular Amazon royalty, in addition, I get a couple more bucks uh, for this partnership affiliation for literally sending them there. So it works out very, very well. How many of those do you typically see a quarter? You know, a lot of, I, this ties into what you said about you really cannot depend on website sales. I will say I probably make, oh, I don't know, if, if it's a great month, maybe $20 in, in extra money from people going from the site, but th that's not where the majority of the book sales are coming from. Um, when it lays out where the purchases are coming from, they are primarily coming off of Amazon or they're coming from Barnes & Noble or Books A Million. That's where they're coming from. Uh, most people are not buying my book off the website. And, and it was just like Matt was saying, most people are not typically going to an author's website. My, my website is a, is a little different. It's titled infamouslady.com, which not yours, Infamous it's Lady is Bathory's. the title of the book, yeah. right? So, and I, what I do though, it's a little, little bit of a, a strategy. When people come to your website, and I'll, maybe I'll go right to marketing with this, I don't mean to usurp you, but people are looking at a website for a reason to stay at it. <laughs> you know. Craft. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. And you want to give them a reason to stay at the site. And a lot of people, in my case, are doing research about Countess Bathory. So I have literally pages of research and photos and excerpts from letters and trial testimonies and all these goodies that you can write a whole term paper at the website. And when people are thinking, oh, where does this come from? Of course, then it coyly goes into, here's this book with all this research. And, and here is the esteemed author who spent years studying this, you know, all that. And then if, if at that point, people are like, oh, if they're thinking I want to buy the book, that's when you can press the link and take your right to Amazon to buy it. One other factor the website offers is you can use it to gather a mailing list of fans for your fan base. And we have our community of Bathory scholars and enthusiasts, which is free to join. You, you all may join if you'd like. Infamouslady.com. Infamouslady.com, thank you. And you just go there and, and we put out a quarterly newsletter that's free for members. And, and you know we, we talk about new research or findings and things like that. But in sales, it's what you would call a list of hot leads. These people are all really into it. I have about 8,000 people on this list. And if I come out with a new Bathory book, they're already there. In fact, they're telling me what they want to see. Kim, in the next edition, we want you to provide ding, 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 ding. Okay. And that's the beautiful thing about social media that I can connect directly with the people who are reading this and then deliver not necessarily what I want to put out, but give them what they want. And you, you can pretty much guarantee when you're giving people what they want, they're going to tend to buy it. So. Mm -hmm. So we'll just keep going with that. So what is your internet presence? The whole thing, the, the website, the social media, the blogs, the articles. I mean, what is your entire social media presence look like? Still me. Yes, you. <laughs> and then we'll, then we'll go on. Since we're just, okay. You mentioned website, you mentioned social uh -huh. media. So yeah. what, what is your entire social, or is it just Facebook? Is that all yeah. you need? Mm, well, I don't think Maybe so. Maybe Twitter? Yeah, well, yeah, we have that, and we have good reads, and um, I'm in a kind of an advantageous position. I'm writing about a real historical figure that has a lot of charisma. It's a very creepy but fascinating story. So one thing I, I, I kind of tell my students when they're thinking about marketing is, can you tap into an existing universe or world of people in your demographics that there's already a place where they reside? Um, for example, uh, I have tapped in and given interviews about Countess Bathory, and I've given interviews to the BBC and to the Discovery Channel and you know, to places like this where they have already an existing fan base of people interested. And by linking up my website with their websites or with the site uh, Bathory.org, which is one of the oldest sites uh, in this country on the, on the subject, I tap into all of those people already existing. When we do a link exchange, for example, 
example, or my link to my site shows up on Wikipedia, which don't forget, you can put yourself on Wikipedia, never forget to do this. Um, it, it, it brings me to a whole group of existing people that I don't have to go out and try to market from scratch or hire someone to you know, send out mailers to or something like that. I'm already making that instant connection with them. Um, so that's something I kind of think is look for somebody in your industry that already has an existing fan base of people interested in your subject matter and then make a link exchange and a friendship. We write about you in our blog or our newsletter. You write about us in yours. We put your stuff up. You put our stuff up. I share your fans. You share my fans. And, and it really helps build your fan base very quickly and easily and usually for no money at all. Tom, can you follow that? Uh, I don't. I don't know if you, I have you to. You kind of tapped into a, an existing group yourself. I, I did with 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 the book that I have now. I I plugged into a literary scene that's called Bizarro, and it's uh, out of Portland. And uh, it's been a, a literary scene for about 15 years. There are a lot of people who read Bizarro, talk about Bizarro. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, share, sh word of mouth is really huge. Uh, way to market in that community. It's also um, a community where it's a, a, a rising tide raises all boats kind of scene where everyone is very supportive of each other's art. Uh, it, it's not competitive, it's cooperative. Uh, going back to the marketing thing too, uh, I started blogging about a year before I put my book out. And uh, during that year, I, I, I worked very hard to authentically interact with people. Uh, I built a network by being a real person, by uh, really uh, looking at what other people were writing and responding to it. Not just like liking things to so that they could see me like drive by real quick and be like, <laughs> uh, you know, but buy like, my book, buy my book. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is the, the worst thing you could could possibly do. Uh, I really tried to support people, you know, with integrity so that. You know, when my book came out, there were a number of people who were ready to review it, ready to talk about it on their websites, uh, ready to recommend it, uh, give me honest reviews for Amazon, for Goodreads, because there's just an endless amount of places where you can have a presence. But if you're not a real person, people will sense that right away, and you'll be out of their network the next day. And so... Um, I, you know, I enjoy meeting readers. I enjoy meeting fellow writers online. And I'd say Ground Zero is my blog, my wordpress.com. It, it was free. You know, I pay $18 a year so that I don't have the WordPress part in the URL. And it just, the, the web address is readtomlucas.com. Mm -hmm. And I like it because I'm embedded in the WordPress network. Whenever I tag an article, anybody can see it by searching for that tag, and I had to really work because I have a generic name. Tom Lucas <laughs> is not unusual. And um, I was on page six of Google when I started, and I had a lot of Tom Lucases I had to knock off the block. <laughs> you know, but I, I, it was a steady march to page one, top mm -hmm. of the list, mm -hmm. but it took three years of being everywhere and backlinking mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. constantly posting and tagging and doing all that metadata stuff to get there. You know, uh, I'm glad I kept my name. I know authors who simply make up a name, Google it. When they find nothing, they know that's the winner. <laughs> that's you my know? plan. Right. So I do recommend that for your book. If you do choose to self-publish, don't use a generic title. Don't use something like, say, haunted, you know? <laughs> Uh, because you will, you n people will never find no. leather to the Corinthians. There's no nothing else that has that title, and it's a great joke. Yeah. Too. <laughs> and uh, haunted love, <laughs> right? So uh, uh, older readers know exactly what I'm going for when they see that title. So they they have a good idea what the book's going to be about, which is going to be it's going to be a lot of satire of mm -hmm. commercialism and whatnot. But um, you know, th it's not going to be confused for anything else. On Google. So when you are thinking about uh, a name for your website, a name for a book, or any kind of content you put out there, uh, part of your marketing plan should be making sure that it uh, stands out, stands up to a Google search, uh, doesn't share the name of something really well known already, um, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, uh, picking up on what Tom was saying, being a good literary citizen is huge. And I don't know if we throw that term around enough, literary citizenship. But basically, you know, it's good karma every time you review somebody else's stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you're making, uh, you're building one more relationship with one more person that, mm -hmm. as Tom was saying, will go out on a limb and maybe review your book uh, when you do that. I know for the, the year, when I knew that my book was coming out, but I didn't know what the date was going to be, I had like this weird year of limbo where I was like, okay, so I'm going to generate some good energy here. So I was blogging almost every day, uh, doing reviews of different literary markets on timetopublish.com. Um, I was... Uh, very active in every area of social media I could find. Um, you know, not saying, hey, my book's dropping, and also this. I mean, I just, my book was not a part of it for a very long time um, because I was trying to build these kinds of professional relationships that, you know, would last. And so, you know, the more you review other people's work, maybe do that on your blog, maybe find other places like new pages where you can review on their websites, which is also important. Um, the more people see you doing that, the more they're going to want to do that for you because you're not the guy that's at the conference putting out flyers with, you know, your face and your book title, and then you're just not there and, you know, nobody knows what's going on. Or you're not the person that's carpet bombing every one of your friend's Facebook pages by posting your book on their wall, like, buy a copy of this today, <laughs> right? Because that's really yep. crappy. And it just makes me mad more than anything else when I see that kind of stuff. Like, I want to be a part of, you know, your publication journey. I don't want you to, you know, just drop a link and then disappear. You're a stranger to me. That's weird. Um, but uh, the other thing, too, and this, this ties along with uh, what uh, Matt was asking about like a question and a half ago, maybe. <laughs> so I make significantly more money when you buy a book directly from me than you do when you buy it from the website. And so because of that, I carry lots of copies of my book with me. <laughs> and I try really hard to get you to buy it for 7 to $15, depending on which book it is. Um, you know, and, and it's tough because if that's the position that you're in, and a lot of people that do indie publishing, that is the position that they are in. Um, you know, you are you are going to have to to do that, and in order to be able to sell those books, you're going to have to make real life, physical, human connections 